right, this is this is uh, kind of how I see us believing in the Bible, 2017. It was pretty awesome. I found this quote. <laughs> so everybody's against you. You know that's that seems like how it is. Uh, in 2017, now we're in 18, maybe even a little worse. But to say you're a Christian, you come with claims. Do you really believe what you say you believe? And that's what we're going to start tackling today. Uh, we're going to start tackling is the, the authenticity of the Bible. Uh, and we're going to go into uh, how it was, the history of it. Because he mentioned some of that today, the history of it. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, uh, let's get started. Can we trust the Bible? Here we go. So I left uh, some blanks on the bottom of your pages so that <coughs> as we go, if you have questions, um, if you have questions, write them down because we want to start answering them. Today we're going to just go over some history. Next week we're going to start tackling questions, tackling arguments for and against. And uh, the goal is for you guys not to remember all this info, but to gain confidence on whether you believe the Bible is true or not. Uh, that's the goal, because especially for us Christians, uh, you know, like we talked about last time, why do you believe in Jesus? Is it just because your parents taught you that? Or um, do you really believe he was an actual person? Did he really exist? Is he is who he says he is? And uh, we already talked about that, but today's the Bible. The Bible. All right, what is the Bible? Can we trust it? Are you confident enough to build your life on it? Okay, because that's, that's really what we're asking you. We're going to go into a service in about an hour, and they're going to preach on the Bible, and we're asking you to reflect your life upon the words written here. And is it reliable enough to do that? Uh, are you confident? And, and the second thing is, are you confident enough to tell other people, to tell your friends that you should build your life on what this book says? I wonder. All right. What is the Bible? Let's just talk a little bit about it. What is it? If you guys were going to uh, explain it to somebody, let's just ask Elmer in the back. What would you? How? What would you say the Bible is? It's a book. It's a book. Okay. Anybody else? How would you describe the Bible? Hey, look, we ain't gonna shoot nobody here. We're just trying to talk. Steve, any? Uh, what's the Bible? How would you describe it? Something you can uh, let people know that it's true. Something you can tell people that, that it's true. All right. Anybody else? What is the Bible? For the I think the Bible is like a set of stories. It's like a, a compilation of a bunch of like viewpoints. Everybody has taken different down stories. Obviously, like Mark, Luke, and like they have different yeah. accounts. So right. I feel like it's even better that we have more accounts of what happened because some some are different. But it like it lets you kind of see that. I mean, they're pretty much they're all telling you a story, and it's all a similar story. But I mean, you can different perspectives. Yeah, different perspectives exactly. But it's it's, good. it's pretty much like instructions. Like somebody somebody told me an acronym that Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving Earth. Right. right. So that's kind of like I mean, it's not true. That's not what it actually stands for. But I mean, yeah. it makes sense because yeah, it kind of helps you like set guidelines on how you should be living your life. Okay. You know? All right. Pretty good. Anybody want to top that one? You know, it's like our, our history, pretty much, as Christians. Christian like, history. Uh, how it all started. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, this is a good question to ask because I know a lot of us here don't like to read the Bible. Maybe because you don't know what it is. I don't know. So, <laughs> here we go. What is the Bible? The Bible is God's written revelation of who He is and what He has done in redemptive history. It's exactly what Javier said, exactly what, um, it's exactly what all you guys said, but it doesn't quite capture it. And I don't know if this quite captures it, but it's, the, it's God's written revelation of who He is and what He's done in redemptive history. From beginning to end, it's God's written revelation, how He's revealed Himself to humanity, and how He's redeemed us, and how, what His plan is, it's written down for us. 
And it's a story. It's a big story from beginning to end. God's love. And uh, I want to read this verse. This is the, probably the only verse we're going to look at today. But this is the claim of the Bible. It's in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So what is this saying about the Bible, that verse? It's making a couple claims. Can you guys uh, spot them out? Inspired by God. Inspired by God. What does that mean? About the what is he saying about the Bible? He's the author. He wrote it. All right, that's what the verse is saying. God inspired it. And in other, and I think there's another verse or this other version that says it's God breathed. So the claim that we as Christians and the people who claim who do believe in the Bible is that they believe that the Bible is inspired by God. Homeboy that we just listened to said the Bible's phony and it's a myth. Um, so you know you've got to pick a side, um, it's, and it's to, and it's there to teach us what's true, what's right, to correct us, how to live. That's what the Bible is. Christians believe that God wrote the Bible. Okay, I listened to some other. I've been listening to a lot of YouTubes, and there was a girl who said, "Yeah, I'm, technically I am a Christian, but I don't believe everything in the Bible. I know some of that you can't believe." You kind of have to pick and choose. And I wonder, do we have that same approach? Uh, you know, David in the back was shaking his head like, yes, of course we do that. No, not you. But, no, he didn't do that. But, you know, we just got to, what do you believe? And that's what I hope that you guys can gain some ground on it. Biblical inerrancy. All right? This is another claim of Christians. And maybe Jerson can help us out. Yes, sir. I just something I wanted to add. Um, because, like, uh, a common idea that even Christians have about the Bible is there's a bunch of uh, men writing oh we're gonna get to uh, that yeah just a bunch of men to their best ability writing about what they think God is like you know and that's a huge it's a huge difference to say um, this God who created everything that we see he created us he designed us life uh, this God revealed Himself through Scripture versus men and women doing their best, sincerest efforts to try and figure out this God that's up there. And uh, when you take a look at all religions, all religions are the same in that respect, in that it is the human being's attempt to try and describe God. And it's a huge, it's a huge bonus. It's a huge point for the atheists because they can, they can rightly claim that how can we trust any human being's idea about God? We're all limited. We're all corrupt. We're all twisted. Or you know, any thought that we have about God, who's to say that's valid at all? But if we say that it is God Himself who is revealing through Scripture about Himself then it throws that argument out the window because it's no longer just human ideas. Now this is this God itself revealing stuff about itself to us. You know? So that's something important to keep in mind. Absolutely. And we're gonna we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But these are the claims and the next claim is biblical inerrancy and it's on your paper so if you want to fill that in. Uh, the claim is that the doctrine that the uh, is this is what inerrancy means. The doctrine that Protest the Protestant Bible is without error or fault in all its teaching, or at least that Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. All right, inerrancy. I'm going to ask you guys about this next week. So blame that big D in the back. Inerrancy. It's a doctrine that Protestant Bible is without error or fault. No error and no fault in what? In its teaching. In its teaching, or that it contradicts. All right. On the contrary, listen to atheists today. They're going to say the Bible does contradict. Did I mess up somewhere? No, no, just go over it. Did you guys get the first blank? Inspired or written by God. Mm -hmm. Written by God, or inspired by God. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Okay. So, 
That's what the that's what Christians believe. And, I, and again, do you believe that? And what are your grounds? Is the Bible really inerrant? Like the guy said earlier in the video, copies after copies after copies. So there's got to be mistakes. We need to know the history in order to answer that question. All right, let's go back and let's check if this guy's really right in all the history. Um, is it really inerrant? And what does inerrant mean but again? Anybody? You on the phone back there? I can look it up. Of course you can. Hey, man, put that thing away. Like YouTube, watch this guy. All right. <laughs> is what does inerrant mean? Somebody. Without error. Without error. Does the Bible have any errors? What do you think? Wow. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I mean, I would think like. By people like translating it, there's going to be some sort of exactly, like, you know. Yeah, exactly. So listen, look at this. I'm going to ask you again, bro. It's a doctrine. <laughs> it's a doctrine that the Protestant Bible is without error or fault in all its teaching. Okay. It's not saying that they didn't misspell something. It's saying that what is taught is perfect. Like the point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're we'll get into that. Oh, you can you know, fill in. All right. Inerrancy. Let's keep moving. All right, Bible 101, this is the very beginning. We're going to be spending a couple weeks on this because, and as I said, as you go, there's questions for, there's areas for question. So, you know, if you're not on your phone, you're going to be thinking. You're going to say, oh, this, I wonder about this. I'm going to write this down, will you? You need a pen? You got one? All right, who wrote the Bible? Okay, Elmer believes God did. No, man did. Did God come down and write the Bible? Not literally. Okay, so who wrote it? Man. Written by believers for believers. All right, yeah, yeah. It was written, it, the verse we said it was inspired by God, right? And that's what Jerusalem was saying. So it was written by God through people, people through men. So God inspired men to write the Bible. He worked through them, his spirit in them. So how that all works, and you know, you can probably word it better. You just interrupt any time, and you just correct me. All right, that's how it works. Yes, God did it using you, or using Moses, or using Paul. And that's what people have a hard time believing uh, because of how flawed we are. All right, so how many people wrote the Bible? Forty. Forty different authors wrote the Bible. Over a span of how many years? Remember the guy said, how old, how old did he say the Bible was when he, you know, Okay, he said it was about 2,000 years. The Bible's uh, a lot older than that. Okay, the, the Bible itself, the New Testament, like you said, yeah, it's maybe 17, uh, no, no, less than that. A little 1,900 years old. Um, but the entire thing, old and new, from 1446 to AD 95, all right, that's our time frame when it was started getting written down. Uh, it was written in, in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. All right. Some people think that Paul used to read the New King James, or the King James Version. Mm -hmm. Not the case. The, thou, though, no. Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew. Those were the <coughs> languages, Old Testament, Hebrew, New Testament, Aramaic, and Greek. All right. Critics believe the Bible is not reliable because it was written by man, like Gerson said. And men make mistakes. Can we all agree? Men make mistakes. Preach it, brother. Amen. Elmer in the back. Did the authors really make mistakes? Okay. That's the question we're going to answer in the next few slides. History. Did they really make mistakes? How did the Bible develop? All right. So, who wrote, who wrote, uh, when did the Bible get started? How did it develop? Let's go from the very beginning. What's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. Who wrote it? Moses. Moses wrote it. Was Moses there during Genesis? Okay, then how do we know he wasn't lying? Just asking. All right? Just asking. Just, I'm just probing. Any ideas? All right, well, uh, the way that they would, the way that they would um, keep all this information... Because Moses didn't start writing until 1446, all right? So that's four, almost 1,500 years before Christ, and we know that the world is a lot older than that. Um, 
what they would do is they would, they, it's called uh, oral tradition, is that they would memorize these stories and they would, from generation, from generation to generation, they would um, tell them and keep them going from generation to generation. They have stories. So there's no real evidence that things were written down up until Moses. So that's what he was, the guy on the video was saying, look, this is all telephone stuff. This is, you know, people telling and telling. But what you don't take into consideration is that was a real skill back then. Is they were good. They would memorize, you know, just in, in, in Jesus' day alone, they would memorize the whole Old Testament. You know that, you know, the five books of the, the five books, the Torah, they'd memorize it. People Am I right? memorize it yeah. right now. People can do it right now. You know, they memorize the whole thing. So, you know, maybe, you know, it's not that, oh, I can't do that. There's no way. That's not how we should look at it. Back then, that's what they did because they didn't have books all over the place. They would remember this stuff. And then, so somebody's grandpa told him, and then he kept the story. He kept it alive telling the next one from generation to generation. And God chose Moses to write it down. All right? And that's how the first Genesis was encountered. Uh, how we get the account of that, and then Moses throughout the whole time. Uh, and then, you know, not even Moses, there's belief that not even Moses wrote the whole five books, that somebody else was writing and helping and stuff like that. So that's a whole other talk. Today we're just going to go over the brief. It's a brief history because it gets deep. All right? God inspired all Moses and all the others to write each book. All right, so let's start with the Old Testament. It was... Uh, Preserved by the Jewish people. So we're just skipping over the whole Old Testament mo and all the books. What's the last book in the Old Testament? Anybody know? Revelation? I mean, Old, Old Testament. Testament. Old Testament. Is it Psalms? Malachi. Oh, I don't even know, actually. Oh I'm just, I forgot. Esther. It's definitely not Psalms, and it's definitely not what Josh said. And it's definitely not Revelations. All right, let's find out right now. I think it's, uh, what did you say? Somebody? I think it's Malachi. Malachi? I'm pretty sure. I don't it remember. is Malachi. It is, okay. Malachi is the last book, all right? So those are the prophets. Homeboy knows this stuff. All right, so that's the last book written. So from that whole thing, they were preserved by the Jewish people, uh, by the scribes. The scribes would write all these down. They would make copies of them for the synagogue so everybody would have them. They were the ones in charge of copying, and it was done carefully. They would copy it, they'd send it to the next guy, he'd proofread it, maybe another guy would proofread it. So they would do this carefully, they'd be checking it, because they didn't have printers back then. You know, just like I made copies of this, that's not the case. Somebody would have to actually write this all down on a piece of papyrus or parchment or something, or on the back of a camel, you know, they skinned them and boom, they started writing it down. Uh, so the whole Testament is called the Law and the Prophets, just throwing that in there. All right, the New Testament... Okay, that's the old one. The New Testament, a little history. The New Testament was written within the first two centuries. We believe it was actually the first century of the death and resurrection of Jesus. All right, why is that important? Because um, it wasn't written a thousand years after Jesus' death. It was written by eyewitnesses or people who knew the eyewitnesses. That's why it's important. All right, and a lot of people today, that's, all that information is pretty uh, reliable. I mean, it's pretty much well known that the apostles were murdered for what they believed in, writing these books, uh, just believing it. The Jews, the Jews, Rome killed them, so they're dead, and they were killed brutally. They were uh, hung. They say Peter was hung upside down. Uh, John was beheaded. Um, you know, because they believed what they wrote, and they wouldn't back down. And I don't know if anybody here today is, believes the Bible that much. Anybody? You get your chance. So that's what I'm hoping is that we get some confidence. Is this really true? The New Testament letters passed around from church to church, and they were copied. All right? So the actual ones that Paul actually wrote on, we don't have those anymore. We have copies. Because what happens is that he would write on a piece of papyrus or parchment or something, and they would pass it around, he said, and then pass it to the next church, and eventually the stuff would start breaking down and degrade. So they would make copies of it. So the, the originals we don't have, but we have the original copies. 
the ones that they copied. Um, and those we have, we have over 2,000 manuscripts. Actually, I think it's 20,000. I think I messed up. 20,000, yeah. Two, it's not that, it's like 20,000. I think it's like, yeah, 20, over 20,000 pieces of manuscripts. All right, and what, you know, we're going to get into all that. Available in the original language, because they're going to say, well, how do you know that the Bible we have today, ESV, I use, how do we know that's true? Because we have the originals, and we just go back to the Greek and check it. And that's how we know. All right, so now we got the Bible. That's a little history of that. How did it get all put together? And the reason why I'm talking to you guys about this is because you need, you, know, you need to know a little history about it, and this is brief, but it helps you answer some of the questions critics have. So how was the Old Testament put together? In, eight, in 90 AD, there was a council of Jamnia, and they came together in 90 AD. They decided uh, which books we need to put together to form the Old Testament. And uh, they looked at it, and they used a couple ways. They said the text needs to be historically accurate, it needs to be written by a great patriarch, and it needs to not conflict with everything else. So that was some of the criteria they used. So just like saying, well, who are we going to choose to be the next uh, leader of something? Who you, you, know, you have a criteria, well, he needs to be good looking, he needs to you know, dress this way, you know, things like that. Um, for the Bible, they said, well, he needs this. They need to be historically accurate. They need to be written by a great patriarch, and they need to not contradict and conflict with everything else. So they did. They chose the 39 books, and they made the Old Testament. And that's how we get this baby. Half of it. The old part. In 90 AD. All right. And then in 303, something crazy happened. Rome said, we want to wipe the Christians out. We need to burn all their literature. Destroy it. You know, like in the, there was a movie where they like burned all the books in Germany. I think it was, yeah, it was during uh, the Holocaust. Fahrenheit 450. It's uh, a book. Yeah. I remember a movie. It's like. Uh, I think it was in Indiana Jones or something. <laughs> where there was this period where they were burning all the books. I think it was the time of Hitler, where they were burning everything. And they, because they were trying to uh, brainwash everybody to, you know, believe one thing so they would. Get rid of all the other books that had to do with anything else. Um, so in 303, Rome said, let's burn all the Christian books. And the only way we have what survived is because people gave up their lives to protect some of these things. The writings of Paul, the Old Testament, they gave up their lives protecting them so that we can have this today. Um, all right, as I said, questions, just write them down. We'll chat a little bit about them. Anybody know what the Gnostic Gospels are? Somebody's got to know. Of course, Jerson knows. Agnostic. Mm -mm. Gnostic Gospels. <clears throat> Are those the, um, like all those like manuscripts that were like hidden in some like cave? That That's the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, Gnostic Gospel. Aren't yes. those those extra books? Extra books. Yes. Like, oh, that extra, like, Peter, uh, Philip. Like, uh, Jesus' childhood? Yes. Jesus' childhood? That's why I said to watch The Da Vinci Code, because you're going to see what some of those Gnostic Gospels say and why the movie was made the way it was. Like the Book of Eli? Book of Enoch, Eli, all those. Okay. Those are called Gnostic Gospels. And we'll probably do another class just on that, uh, eventually, if you guys have questions about it. But a lot of people say, well, why don't you use those? Uh, and I won't get too much into that, but what happened is that there was these, these other ones going around, and they, this council got together called the Council of Carthage in 367. They said, we got to figure out, we got to figure out who, which, which ones we're going to, uh, which ones are the authentic, which ones are real, and because there's a lot of stuff getting passed around, people are getting all confused. So they met, and they decided... Uh, which Gospels were written by the Apostles and their close companions. Those are the ones they decided to use. They had to be written by the Apostles or somebody who was a close companion. Those are the only Gospels or letters we're going to use. Uh, because pe people were starting to get confused with the false Gospels. Uh, Thomas, there's a whole lot of them. I didn't even know how many. There's a lot. So you're saying those books aren't all true? Or there's no. more? 
produce a lot of flies. Yeah, they, they contradict. Some of them say Jesus kissed somebody. Some of the gospel you know. basically Jesus and Mary were together. Together. Kids. kids. Yeah. I mean, if that's true, that changes a lot, okay? <laughs> but why would they keep record if it's false? It's, so they were written like two to three hundred years after this all happened. Um, except maybe a couple of them. Um, like the, the Gospel of Hebrews, I think. It's called the Gospel of Hebrews. That one might have been written earlier. But that the reason is because they weren't written by... Uh, the apostles, and they weren't written by someone closely associated with them. They're written much later by who knows who, um, and uh, and they they were contradicting. And we can get into that. We can look at it because that's big. Uh, why do we have what we have today and not all the others? Because the Catholic Bible does have a couple of extras in them. Um, all right. So there's 27 books in the New Testament. This is when they this is when they decided what to do. Uh, because in the Da Vinci Code, they say that it was actually the Council of Nicaea with uh, Constantine that actually determined which books, which is not the case. But you would know that unless you knew the history, as I didn't know that. All right. So then we get through that period, and then we go to the Dark Ages. And the Dark Ages was where uh, education and all that was, was discouraged arts, all these things, nothing like today. This was a time where nobody was learning. It was the dark time. But there was these people who shaved the middle of their heads and left the sides open called monks. I don't know, actually, that's what they did. I mean, that's what we see in movies. But, and they wore robes. They were in, uh, you know, just in dark places because they were the ones keeping it alive. They were the ones preserving the Bible. They were the ones copying it. They kept it alive. And they... Uh, they were the ones who, who, I believe they copied it from Greek and Aramaic into Latin. They're the ones who translated it, uh, and making sure it was accurate. And again, if I'm messing up, you just stop me. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going a little fast, I'm sorry. Uh, but just some more, a little bit more info. The Renaissance period, it went through the Renaissance period in 1300. It sparked up. We want to get all excited about art and science and everything again. And then this guy named John Wickland translated the Old Testament from Latin into English. Okay, so that's how the translation started, Old Testament first, Latin to English. And then John Gutenberg, which you might have learned this in history class in high school, uh, he created the printing press, and he printed the Bible. It took him five years to make the, uh, all the, um, they said get all the words ready just to print it. Just to prep all the different pages to start printing. It took him five years to get it ready. And then he started knocking them out uh, in Latin. Uh, so, when did we get the first complete English translation of the Bible? 1535. 1535. The guy's name was William Tyndale. That's who we got the Tyndale Publishing Company, who publishes a lot of Bibles and Christian literature. Um, he was the first guy, he began translating the English uh, from Latin to English. He was the one who started it. But the uh, Catholic Church got real mad at him and burned him before he could finish it. Burned him at the stake. But not burned him like steak. <laughs> right at the stake. You know, and, and it's, it is crazy. He did that so that we could have an English translation. And, um, yeah, he, I mean, murdered. Because he really believed that it was important. So I know that for a lot of us, you know, we take this, like, man, I have five Bibles, what the heck? You know, we, take, we don't take it seriously. I mean, ooh, I don't want to read that, it's so boring. You know, but for something caused this guy to give up his life so that we can have it. Something, something's got to be special about it. All right, and this guy, Miles Coverday, completed the work. He completed it. All right, so Bible verses. The Bible wasn't always in verses like we have today. It was just... Big thing. So when you study the Bible, think about that. This wasn't always in verses. This was written in big, like, letters. And, you know, sometimes we get hung up on, well, this verse and that verse don't go quite together. Maybe because it wasn't always that way. Uh, and maybe they didn't write it that way. Uh, just in <coughs> studying the Bible. But in 1565, there was a Swiss group who 
broke it all down into verses 1565 all right so what are we in now we're in 2018 so that's about 400 and something years ago all right that's when it got into verses so before that no verses just straight reading it uh, so it's a little different and the king james version popped out 50 years later that's where you get the first version king james crazy and now we got a whole lot of them all right oh, so the question are there mistakes in the bible after all that translation hundreds of years any mistakes elmer seems to think there isn't there are they're called variances i'm going to ask you about that i'm going to ask you about inerrancy and i'm going to ask you about variances uh, I have it up there. Uh, where is it? Somewhere around there. There is V A R I A N C E S. All right. Biblical variances are mistakes, errors made in translation. Okay. There's over. You know how many there are? Over three hundred thousand. <laughs> you know how many words are in the New Testament? Three hundred thousand. Make you think a little bit. 300,000 variances. 300,000 variances. There's about 300,000 words in the New Testament. There's this guy named Bart Ehrman. Uh, he do, he's, an, he's a Gnostic. But he studied the Bible. And he's the one who's making these quotes. And he's the one who's confusing a lot of people. But it's true. But what is a variance? Variances are mistakes in translation. Like he spelt it wrong. Maybe as he was, he was you know, the scribes. Way back then, the monks, he was translating, and he fell asleep on his table. And he's just, you know, knocked out. He woke up. Oh, man, where was I? And he maybe skipped the line, and he started somewhere else. Those are mistakes like that. Uh, misspellings. Uh, they added stuff. Uh, there's one, in, if you have your Bible, uh, we can look at it. Um, I think it's in Mark. Is that they? And the cool thing about the Bible... Is they don't throw in all the spelling errors because what they do is they go back, they look at all the manuscripts, and they say, okay, what is what is consistent in all of these? Where are some mistakes? And they use, uh, you know, they use uh, ways to determine what to do. But in Rome, in in Mark, you'll see that there was a there's a piece in here that isn't in all the manuscripts, but they'll tell you that this part isn't in there. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever noticed it. Mark? Yeah, where is it? Let's see. Mark chapter 9, I think. Uh, yeah, let's go to 16. All right, Ch Mark chapter 16, from verse 9 to 19, it says, Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include verses 9 to 20. All right? So that's a variance. They're not all the same. But they don't include this, they say. But... What we have to know about inerrancy, because the Bible's inerrancy means there's no error in its teaching. And what we're saying is that there are mistakes. There's a lot of them. But none of them affect the teaching of the Bible. How accurate is the Bible? And this is why everybody knows this. All the historical scholars know this percentage. How accurate do you think the Bible is? Thoughts? 99. Are you sure? 99.9. .9. Not that, no, it's not that accurate. It's like 99.5 or 99.6, I don't remember. But I mean, that's pretty accurate with that many variances. That is pretty accurate. 99 point something percent. Even with all that, because none of it affects the teaching of what the Bible is teaching. None of it does. Not a single mistake. Um... All right, and uh, so, whoops, so this is the last slide. So who wrote the Bible? Just in conclusion, men, men did, all right, men did. God, through men, God wrote the Bible, all right, yes. God wrote it through men. It's inspired through men. Um, so, you know, a lot of the arguments, like, like Jerson was saying, men wrote the Bible, they make mistakes. But I think the beauty of it, is that God used messed up people to do it, to accomplish His will. And I was thinking this week about the uh, just Jesus. Do you think Jesus' whole lineage, like everybody before Him, do you think they were all 
like godly men, perfect. I mean, do you think Jesus came from the best stock? Thoughts? Anybody? Steve, what do you think? Jesus, the Son of God, like his lineage. Because that's where, you know, you look at, oh, he's a king. He must have had, like, whoa, great kings, which he did. He had David was in his lineage. I think there was any, uh, uh, what are the girls who sell themselves? What do they call them? Prostitutes. Prostitutes. And Jesus' lineage. <laughs> I know, I was just testing everybody. Do you think there was prostitutes in his lineage? Murderers? Mm-hmm. Cowards? Mm-hmm. Could be. There were. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was it? Rahab? Rahab was part of Jesus' lineage, and she was a harlot, a prostitute. Not uh, even Jewish. Not even Jewish. Top that. Judah, the tribe of Judah, he slept with his son's wife. Yeah. Crazy stuff. But the point is, the point is, and it's all true, but the point is that God accomplished his will through flawed and messed up people. We have this word, we have the book written, inspired by God, even through us. Even And I think the hope is what I'm seeing is this, because as I learn to gain confidence is that even God could use me in all of my mistakes. You know, he could accomplish his will through me and everything I've done and whatever I might do. Because I know he's done that in my dad. He's accomplished his will through my dad. My dad is not, he didn't always used to be who he is now. He was robbing stores. You know, he had lots of girlfriends. Don't tell my mom, but, you know, you know, before her, you know, he, he would, you know, drink and just, he was a mess. But God had came in and changed things. And that's, uh, that's the hope I find is as we study the book is that a lot of people say, well, you know, that's it's a bunch of fairy tales and all that stuff. And next week we'll start looking into some of the arguments, but that's a little brief history. But I'm encouraged to know that God can work through all that. That, you know, over time he had inspired people to write down exactly what we need to know. And there's other verses in there that uh, talk I didn't include, but it's God... And God, or, or He made this all available for us so that we can know who we are in Christ. It's a story from beginning to end of what He's doing, what He's done, what He wants to do. And I know a lot of us don't really like to pick this book up because it's hard to understand. But if you get the picture, is that it's written from beginning. The end is already in there. You know, you can look at it. The end's already there. Um, and it's, but it's a beautiful story of what God is doing, what He's done. So, uh, do you guys have any questions or things you want to go over next week uh, that may have come up during this this class? If you'd rather not say, you can write it down, you can give me your paper if you want, but <laughs> you guys, any, uh, you got, you want some more clarification on maybe the New Testament, who actually wrote it? Um, you, want to, you don't want to know more about the Gnostic Gospels, like why weren't they included? What did they actually yeah, say? Yeah, kind of cool to hear about some of those. Yeah. All right. I mean, there's some cool stories in some of them. Like I've heard the story that it's like when Jesus was a kid, he was he was playing and and he like he blew into his hand and then he he, he made birds. Like yeah. He made some birds and they were flying. But I mean, I guess yeah. it didn't make the cut. Like, there was a story also about uh, James or John that one time he was sitting on a bed and all these flies were bugging him. And he said, flies, you go out and stay in, you know, in a secluded place by yourself. And they did. And then in the morning, he woke up and he saw them all there and he felt bad. He's like, all right, you can come back. You know, and they all went back under the sheets in the bed. And so, you know, there's stories like that. But they look at those and they think, you know, is that, that sounds like, you know, that all, all ain't true. But so, you know, they looked at ways, why isn't that one included? And they used this criteria to do that. But if you get time, watch the Da Vinci Code this week because you're probably going to get more questions. That was huge. That shook a lot of people up. You know, a lot of people who weren't secure in their faith. What the heck? Jesus actually had a girlfriend and, you know, he had kids with her and all this stuff. And their faith just, boom, I'm gone. I'm out of this Christianity thing. Um, And, you know, the the gentleman we looked at earlier, um, uh, you know, he certainly doesn't believe the Bible. He thinks it's a myth, which, you know what? Any of you go to college... Uh, you're going to be in the class. They're probably going to tell you that. Uh, but, you know, historically, if you look historically at all these things, um, 
find that it's not all true. So the goal is for you guys to be as confident as John Wick in the midst of our generation. Because if you say you believe the Bible, go into your class and say, I believe the Bible. And I remember in one of my classes they said, no, you don't believe all that Genesis phony stuff. I was like, ooh, I don't know how to combat that. you know. So I didn't say anything because I didn't really know. I feel scared. Yeah, I was a chicken. So I hope that we can, we can do some studying so that we're prepared not only to talk to other people, but to know that what we believe is really true. This isn't just because our parents told us so. Uh, we believe it. Um, so next week we'll start our next one. So we hope you can attend. And we're going to end class right now. So...